Hello, Bookaholics. This is Deirdre Pippins bringing you another episode in our Mental Health Awareness Series. Today, we are going to talk to Rohit Gupta, who is the author of The Invisible Filter. We're going to explore how thoughts and your environment can affect your mind and your decisions and ways and techniques to help you work your way through these thoughts. So stick with us and we'll talk to Rohit after this. Hi, Rohit. Thank you for joining the Bookaholic podcast. Hi, Deirdre. Thank you so much for having me. It's great to be here. Yes, yes, yes. Well, thank you so much. Uh, we are continuing the mental health awareness series and your area is coming from career, correct? Uh, career, but to be honest, the book that I've kind of uh, written, The Invisible Filter, touches on mental health in many different ways, um, yeah, okay. both through my personal experiences and okay. other kind of research. Um, so I'd love to share more on that side. Yes, yes. Well, let's start with uh, the fact that you had a totally different career Mm. prior to becoming a writer. And so you were in the uh, financial aspect. You were in a venture capitalist? Yeah, that's correct. Yeah, I was working mm -hmm. at a venture capital fund where we were investing in cybersecurity and infrastructure startups that were kind of at the Series A to the Series D stage. So companies that had a lot of customers and needed more money and support to kind of scale and hopefully become unicorns or, you know, have good outcomes. Right, right. Now, describe to me, first of all, what uh, did you go to school for this? Is this something a person can learn and get a degree, not in venture capitalism, but your, yep. what was your degree? Yeah, so I actually have a business background. I graduated from UC Berkeley's Haw School of Business, which was okay. more of a general, I'd say, kind of business curriculum that covers mm -hmm. finance, accounting, marketing, um, all the different kind of business functions. And I think that was really helpful just at a high level, but work experience wise. Now I previously worked in investment banking as well as product management. And I think those two were really helpful to be able to do the financial type of analysis that you kind of encounter in that role. And then on the product side to understand, you know, how do companies actually have product market fit? When do you know if they're actually delighting their customers? versus building something that the team thinks is interesting, but the market doesn't really need. So I think those yeah. experiences really helped a lot. Yes, yes, yes. It sounds like it did. Now, venture, venture capital, is that a high pressure job? Is that very stressful? Oh, totally. Yeah. Okay. Um, you know, I worked in a few different types of firms and, you know, the hours kind of vary, but the the pace and the lifestyle is such that you're always on call. You might oh. get a call from your lead, your partner mm -hmm. at like 9 p.m. to get something done by the next morning. People on your team pinging you like throughout the day to just get mm -hmm. stuff done in the next mm -hmm. 20 to 30 minutes. Something mm -hmm. we call fire drills. So it can be a really stressful and a really hectic mm -hmm. kind of demanding job. You know, I worked yeah. a lot of weekends um, as well. So it, it was just very time consuming. Totally. Wow. Wow. Well, that's enough to give you, uh, you know, some type of mental health condition, surely. Now, let's talk about uh, your transition of your career. So you go all the way from financial, venture capitalism, all of that business oriented stuff, which is, say, the right brain. And then you go to make a decision that you're going to be a writer, which is all the way to the other side and right. the left brain. So how did you make that transition and why? Yeah, 100%. I think it's a great question. And it's it's obviously something I asked myself a lot before I kind of made that move. And I think Deirdre, quite candidly, it was COVID that was the catalyst for that kind of eye-opening, you know, self-awareness where I realized that, you know, my day-to-day -day job was not very fulfilling. It was very intellectually stimulating and it paid well. Um, there was some kind of impact of what I was doing, but I felt like I wanted to be building. I wanted to be creating 
And, you know, through COVID working on my book and some other projects, I realized I'm at my best when I'm building, not kind of serving as a supporting, you know, agent for what other people are building and creating. And so that was just a really big catalyst to reconsider. Is this mm -hmm. career really something that I want to be doing for the next five to 10 years? And I realized no. So I decided to leave that job um, and all the perks that came with it to, yeah, focus on writing part time while actually exploring opportunities in sustainability and climate tech, which is an area I'm really personally passionate about and hoping mm -hmm. I can actually build, you know, a company or something in that space to make a difference. Wow. Well, you know, there's two things I get out of that. Like I've talked to many different people on this channel. Um, COVID did a lot. COVID either kind of destroyed you, you know, really hurt you and brought you into possibly a deeper depression or onset of depression, for an example. It's certainly for some people brought on grief because a person close to them may have died from COVID right. and grief has its own maybe, and I'm not a doctor or anything, but I'll say temporary mental health condition because you're having, having to walk through those steps of grief. Mm -hmm. Or either it made people realize like yourself, hey, this is my one life to live and I'm not going to waste it, you know, and it just opened up your mind to say, I'm going to do something different. Or I'm going to do something better. Um, right. So, that you know, COVID did a lot. It did a lot, you know, self-reflection, you know, whatever have you. It did a lot to to everyone. To everyone. So yeah. Be one person on the earth and say, oh, COVID didn't do anything to me. I'm fine. No, just fine. no doubt. No. And just to be fair, I gained 10 pounds. Um, yeah. I struggled a lot with loneliness and, you know, kind of depression, especially from the work and not mm -hmm. feeling like there was any barrier between work and the rest of my life. And right. with a demanding job, yeah, it, it just got really difficult. So I, my anxiety yeah. was heightened, definitely felt a little depressed at times, if I can be honest. Yeah. So just to share it, it wasn't it wasn't all kind of positive, and I think like right. everyone, it's a right. mix of good and bad. You know, there yes. are blessings and curses that. Came yes, from. yes, and it definitely brought on isolation. Um, one of the things I discovered is, okay, so for for an example, I'm married. My husband is super, super extra, extra social. Oh. Uh, you know, I mean, he's, he's hyper social. He takes social to the next level. Nobody can compete. With him. <laughs> <laughs> he makes it a competition. No. <laughs> and, and, you know, I'm social, but not as much as my husband. And I think maybe people will see us as a couple. They'll say, oh, Greg is really hyper social. And Deirdre, I wouldn't say they would say I was an introvert. I'm nowhere near that. But they would say, well, she's a lot more maybe guarded or whatever have you. Yep. And so the isolation aspect of COVID came through and you did not realize while you were like, right, me and my husband were literally, uh, before there was the vaccine and before there was the mask, we were racing to the drugstore or to the grocery store because they suggested that's about the only places you should really go. Right. Uh, church was closed, which is a, a social place. Um, libraries shut down, you know, so, you know, you certainly couldn't go party with your friends or anything like that. You didn't go to any other person's house. So that isolation began to build. And what I didn't realize as a not hyper, hyper social person is that I needed to see that random person in a parking lot that right. was going to the grocery store like I was, you know, I mean, you could count the number of people that were in the grocery store, you know, or on the road. I live in a rural, suburban, rural area, and you could, you could literally go down a stretch of road for five miles or 10, and you're the only car on the road. That was very scary. That was very scary and frightening, the isolation that we began to get in. And and like I said, once again, I'm married. I do have two grown sons, but mm -hmm. we they we were all here at our home, um, you know, together. We could spread out here and all be safe here and watch each other and all this kind of things. But, you know, I didn't think about people who may be single 
and living in an apartment, already a confined space, right? And you get on parks or other people and all these things. And then all of a sudden you were in your small confined apartment that, you know, that COVID did a lot of things. <laughs> it did a 100%. lot. And I'm sorry it to hear that for you too. It, you know, it was really difficult given, you know, your personality and just, yeah, being in that more, I'd say isolated area just naturally made the existing situation really difficult. And I yes. think something that, you know, I thought of as you were sharing more was, Yes. You know, on the mental health side, you yes. know, there were these triggers, right? You'd feel yes. lonely, you'd feel, you know, you know, anxious, sad, that kind of then led to, I don't know for you, but for me, coping mechanisms, I yes. turned to eating, so yes. comfort food, I was, you know, smoking more, and just all these unhealthy habits to try and make myself feel better. And that actually made my mental health worse. Because, yeah. you know, it's crazy how that works where your coping mechanisms, which are trying to help you, you know, from feeling bad, actually make you feel worse. And yeah. it's a really vicious cycle. I'm not sure if you found yourself in that, but I definitely did. And it took months in COVID to really try and break that pattern and, yeah. you know, do that introspection, which was really tough. Yes. yes, I gained so much weight during COVID, like you said, you know, like you know, the only places to go was grocery store was one of the main yeah. places. So you were picking up ice cream and we got so bad because it was four of us here. You know, everybody got a half gallon of their favorite ice cream. So there was oh, four no. different flavors of ice cream in uh. the freezer. And so you taste a little bit of somebody else's one day and you eat your, it was a nightmare. Oh man! So, so yeah, I had to go back and I went back to the gym and have subsequently lost my COVID weight. Thank goodness. I've lost Thank all God. of my COVID weight. That's but awesome. let's talk about, let's talk about your book, the invisible filter, which mm -hmm. are coping mechanisms, correct. Uh, from getting you through uh, some mental health challenges. So you were in COVID is that the only factor that led you to write that book? Oh, no. So just to clarify, yep. So the invisible uh, invisible filter is actually kind of about how mental models or thought patterns kind of shape our lives. And yes. I think yes. one way that plays out is these coping mechanisms, which are kind of our way and the story that we tell ourselves of, hey, it's okay to be eating this because I feel this way, it's okay to, you know, do X or Y, um, which sadly reinforces that negative cycle. And I think, you know, the key insight I have from my book is that to kind of change our habits and our behavior, we have to first change those underlying patterns of thinking that are kind of shaping how we think and how we act and coping mechanisms play, you know, a big role there. But to answer your question, Deirdre, in terms of, um, you know, what was really the inspiration for the book? To be honest, it was a mix of some embarrassing experiences I had and uh -huh. just realizing more about this topic, which I learned about as a product manager working at a startup where mental models are something that we learned to kind of study in our users. So how do your users, you know, think about a product, think about a service? Mm -hmm. in ways that they themselves are not aware of. So we'd mm -hmm. have to do user research and studies to kind of unearth these insights that people aren't usually aware of. And, you know, I thought that was a really interesting concept in the, you know, context of product development and marketing. Mm -hmm. But then I realized, I think that plays a role in our day-to-day -day lives as well. It's that same dynamic of having these patterns of behavior and thinking that we're not really aware of that shapes our, our lives. And I think my impetus for writing the book was this embarrassing encounter where there were, you know, I was walking down the street. I live in San Francisco, um, a little close to the Tenderloin district. So, you know, no stranger to having some homeless folks, you know, yeah. around where we live. Um, I was walking down the street. I saw a group of um, actually African-American men just down mm -hmm. the block. And without realizing it, I turned right and just avoided that them in that situation. 
even right. though there was nothing that was dangerous about them. They're just a group of guys just hanging out on the sidewalk. But right. my ingrained kind of pattern of thinking, you know, based on these experiences, social kind of, um, you know, exposures and media really mm -hmm. kind of caused me to associate them with danger. Which right. was really upsetting to me as someone right. who is an advocate for diversity and inclusion in my workplace yes. and, you know, deeply appreciates black culture as well. It was really upsetting to me that my ingrained way of thinking kind of betrayed me. And that was kind of what led me on that rabbit hole of trying to understand what are the many ways that these patterns influence us, like with our yeah. mental health, our kind of stereotypes that we form about other people, the pressure to pursue different careers. So it kind of led me on that rabbit hole. And then COVID was, you know, a difficult time, but it gave me the opportunity to work on the book um, and kind of focus on that to, to get yeah. it. Out. Yeah. You know, that that's interesting in what you're saying. It goes back to uh, sociology 101, basically back when I was in college. And it's like um, a person can feel that they're totally anti-racist or something to that nature, but still get on the elevator with a person of color and want to clutch their handbags. You know, right. now, now this happened today. This has happened to me oh. today. And no, not, not that, but oh, to say, oh, okay. uh, I was walking through a parking lot in the city uh, and I was headed to go to this cafe that I love the food there to get myself some takeout. Mm -hmm. And so a person had their van door wide open. They were doing stuff. You know, sometimes you have to organize yourself, steps yourself before you get out of your car or whatever have you. And I said to myself, well, I don't want to walk right beside this van and this person's got their door all open because it made me feel uncomfortable if they were to think something of me, like here comes a black woman, is she oh, going yeah. to try to ask for me for money, even though I don't look like I would be doing anything like that? Right. Or is she going to try to rob? You know, you just never know. So I don't. The, so therefore, I, as a person of color, don't like to put myself in iffy situations of where somebody may have those thoughts. Right. So I all the way around that section of the parking lot just to not have that experience. Now, I don't know what that is to say, but that's the other side of it. Right, right. And I'm so sorry it. to hear that. And yeah, you know. yeah. I mean, and so yeah. this is not our subject for today, but just to throw this these sentences in, that's what African American people are trying to tell people about our trauma, our PTSD right. as a group. We're not a monolithic group when it comes to ideas and political thoughts and all of these things, but right. we do all suffer from a historical trauma. And so we've been trying, once George Floyd's episode actually happened, which was horrible, but it did, as his daughter said, it's he's going to change the world. You know, it made us all think, oh my gosh, we knew this, but we're telling people now we have PTSD as a group. Right. As a group. And to see people dismiss that and dig their heels in and say, oh, no, and all this is it's very heartbreaking. And uh, it's been a lot of people you thought were your friends and it's been a lot of people you thought were your allies. And it's very right. heartbreaking to hear that and to see that. So but that's another story. But right. just, you know, as we were talking, that's that's the other side of it. So, yeah. So yeah, that 100%. And so as an ally and I consider myself an LGBTQ uh, ally as well, you know, for, for that, but I don't want to make, make sure that I accept when I'm encountering, you know, I've got to be all the way in, mm. you know all the way in and accepting all people. That's how I raised my sons. You know, one of the first right. places I took my children uh, and we have family and friend that live, friends that live in this area is P-Town, Massachusetts, Provincetown, Massachusetts. Mm -hmm. And that's a huge population that was traditionally for gay people. You know, mm -hmm. our gay people had to run really up to P-Town or run to, um, what's the place in Florida? Um, the Keys, the Florida Keys, you know, right. or in your town, San Francisco. Or and San I was Francisco. like, that's yeah. not right. That's not right, you know. But I took my sons there because I wanted my sons to know 
and accept all people and not be afraid or if right. they saw two men or two women holding hands or whatever, not to be freaking out. I wanted right. them to look at them as people and with respect. And right. um, so, you know, so I'm like, I'm like, and like you, I want to be authentic, an authentic ally. Totally. You know? so, totally. Yeah. Wow, so I appreciate you sharing that because yeah. it's a journey and it's really, you know, it's crazy because even for people, as you said, who think that, you know, they might be like that in yes. certain situations, those patterns and those ingrained kind of yes. assumptions are activated a yes. lot of times without us being aware of it. And I think that's kind of the crazy dynamic here is, you know, the same thing, you know, kind of applies, you know, as you mentioned with George Floyd, which was a, a terrible incident, but thank God that sparked a lot more yeah. awareness around, you know, the issues facing the black community. But it's crazy because even with Black Lives Matter movement, there are still shootings of unarmed black oh. men and women. Yeah. So to me, it's really crazy because we have never been more aware of the systemic issues that, and the trauma, as you mentioned, that's, you know, yes. within your community. But at the yeah. same time, it's still difficult to make progress to change that. Right. And you have to ask yourself, why is that? Yes. And to me, my perspective on this was it's because these ways of thinking have been so reinforced by movies and TV, by media, yes. by, yeah. you know, everything that we're seeing that really kind of criminalizes and yes. you know, humanizes black men and women. Yes. And that lingers, even if, you know, consciously we're more aware of our bias, it's still, you know, very much part of you, just as how, you know, on the mental health side, yes. even if you try to be more positive, and that's something I've struggled with as someone who has a tendency to kind of have negative spirals, even if you remember to try and be more positive, right. you still have that inner kind of pattern that yeah. leads you to be negative. It's yes. still really difficult to kind of change that. So yes, that, yes. Well, let's let's dive into your book and 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 talk about those 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 patterns those thoughts. Give us some. Um, we've talked about one uh, that was kind of surrounding race. Give us some more patterns. Uh, and we said media is one of those places where these things can come from. Uh, like I mentioned to you, sociology one hundred and one. That's all I took in college. So inform us greater about some of these other thoughts and where they come from. Yeah, one hundred percent. You know. I think to kind of look at mental models, I kind of took an approach of thinking about how are they formed? What is the mm -hmm. kind of cycle to your point of how these things are created? Mm -hmm. And my kind of hypothesis here is you start with your experiences, your yes. sociocultural norms, your media exposure, as well as the ways of thinking of people in your community. That's mm -hmm. kind of the starting point for mm -hmm. how these assumptions and mm -hmm. exposures start to develop into truths that we internalize that mm -hmm. shape our ways of thinking, which yeah. actually influence then our actions, our thoughts, and our perspectives that simply reinforce those patterns of thinking that we started to develop. Right. And the cycle kind of continues. So as you get more exposures, more experiences that sometimes confirm, you know, mostly confirm your kind of way of thinking, that confirmation bias, yes. it simply reinforces that pattern of thinking until it's really difficult to change, which I think is kind of what we mentioned before, um, whether that's on the career side, you know, the mental health side, or in terms of, you know, stereotypes and racism as well. So that's kind of the perspective I took um, mm -hmm. from the invisible filter, which is how do we understand where these mental models come from? What kind of role do they play in broader society in kind right. of our lives? And then how do we actually change them to live healthier and more fulfilling lives as well? Yeah. Yes. Well, I think your book is definitely one of uh, coming of an age right now. Um, it's something that's definitely needed and more people need to know about it um, because we need to work our way and work ourselves through a lot of these issues. Of course, all of them, but a lot of these issues and take them very seriously because if we don't, 
We're concentrating on issues where there's something else going on over here that's going to surprise us all. And we're going to have to all come together to work on whatever's boiling over here. You know, so so we got to we got to master uh, some of these thoughts of negativity. You know, I know one and I, I am in the uh, very traditional South. Uh, the American South here. And so there's a lot of traditional thinking that goes on. Well, my grandpa stood for X, Y, and Z. So I'm going to stand for X, Y, and Z. And that's your only community. I guess that goes back to your community. Um, You know, or I'm a black Baptist and this is how we do it. And this is how we're going to continue to do it. And we're not going to let X, you know, so yeah, we, we've got these thoughts, but, and it's to not say, you know, a lot of people get really offended. Well, your grandfather was wrong. Oh, you know, there would be totally outraged. How can you say your grandfather was wrong? Let's fight. That's what I say. Like, you know, yeah. I'm not get upset when people, yeah, you feel attacked. You go yes. into a defensive mode. And, you know, I feel the same way coming from a very strict Hindu upbringing where we were really taught that there's a certain way to live your life, to yes. think about your life that I spent years trying to, you know, unlearn and appreciate in many ways, but come to my own conclusions of what it is to live a meaningful life and how to get, can I get there? So I can definitely appreciate um, the power of tradition and culture and how those ways of thinking become very sticky and they're not always the best things or they don't lead to, I'd say the best kind of outcomes because you know, they were created in situations and contexts that many, in many cases, don't really apply today. And right. to me, it's always silly. It's right. like you're trying to fit a square peg into a round hole. It's kind of like how I feel almost generally about trying to apply those patterns to today. I guess um, one example on the, you know, my kind of heritage inside is, you know, it's almost an expectation that you have kids. Um, Okay. You know, it, it's very, it's kind of written into the code from a young age. My parents are just like, you know, can't wait to have grandkids. Like, oh my God. And I'm at a point with my girlfriend of five years where we don't know if we want kids. And, right. you know, it was a tough decision to come to and think about. And that was really difficult for my parents. And it right. continues to be naturally so, I think, right. for any parent who wants out of their kids or their culture kind of really yes. holds that to a high esteem. Yes. It's been really difficult for them to hear that. But, yeah. you know, I think it's great to have those conversations so that, you know, we can all live our best lives free from the pressures and constraints of yes. these different kind of patterns that exist. Exactly. Exactly. Because that's certainly, you know, if your culture is quote unquote demanding that you have children, that can be very stressful because when you were first telling me this, I immediately thought, well, what about those people that have to get IVF? And what about those people that have unsuccessful IVF journeys? Not, not everybody's IVF journey is totally. successful. You know, so, you know, that that leads to people feeling empty or shame or guilt. And exactly. so, yeah, that's definitely... Um, something that a person has to come to conclusion of their own, you know? And so I can you for you and your girlfriend for taking that stance and telling the truth and, you know, and letting them know, you know, and there's this, well, before I tell you the two things that's really coming out of this for me, let me go into now how, um, what was your research like with your book? How can Mm -hmm. people trust the research of of your book? Totally. Yeah. So in terms of my research or the way I approach the content of the book, it was all a mix of my personal stories and experiences Okay. Speaking yes. with experts in different fields. So for instance, when I share some ways to kind of change your thought patterns, ways to improve your mental health, those include anything like, you know, meditation or transcendental meditation, mm-hmm. cognitive behavioral therapy, mm-hmm. actually psychedelic assisted therapy, uh-huh. or even just better introspection. I spoke with experts in pretty much every one of those fields just to understand how does this work in practice? What were mm-hmm. what have your experiences been like? What mm-hmm. are things that all of us can do on a day-to-day basis or yes. try to seek help for to actually yeah. kind of implement this? So maybe one example on the cognitive behavioral therapy side, 
I spoke with Dr. Michael Claiborne, who's mm -hmm. been a, a licensed practitioner of CBT for about 20 years. Okay. He's even doing his own consultancy in this kind of uh, field of things. He's helped over a hundred different patients work through either their individual or a couple related issues, usually related to mental health by using mm -hmm. CBT techniques. And so in the book, I kind of share more about different patient examples, anonymized yeah. that he was willing to share, you know, five or six different techniques that all of us can even try at home, whether mm -hmm. that's you know, thought journaling or just keeping track of, you know, your kind of thinking, catching your yeah. thoughts. So yes. preventing that negative spiral by just, you know, really thinking, you know, why am I thinking so negatively? Why am I thinking this way? What is that yeah. serving me? So yeah. that's kind of the approach I took with the book is um, yes. a lot of kind of experts in addition to my own independent research, um, looking at different papers and translating that into different stories was kind of how I tried to, you know, really gain credibility on these topics. Yes. Yes. Perfect. Perfect. Thank you for that. And do you have, now that you've made the decision to be a writer, do you have any books coming up? Have you been writing anything recently? Ah, so I'm still ideating on the next book. I think the okay. topic I really want to explore is nostalgia and the many different ways that nostalgia influences us, whether that's you know, in terms of fashion, right? Thinking of yes. dressing it with like retro or vintage, whether that's, you know, the tendency to look back on our past in a very rosy way, even if it wasn't all, you know, glitz and glam, whether that's the kind of mental health effects of, you know, engaging in nostalgia. And I just think it's a really fascinating type of phenomena and effect that similar to mental models, you know, really shapes us in ways that we're not always aware of. And I'd love yeah. to examine that a little deeper. Um, yeah. So yeah, I'm thinking about that for the next one. That sounds really great because I'm a person, um, I don't live in the past. I don't live in the past. Let me say that. But I do like old movies, black and white movies, black and white TV shows. And one of the, I like to look at them sometimes because I work so much and I work with my mind so intent intently that just to have a black and white TV show on that I don't have to think about the storyline mm. that I've seen a million times, you know, that just kind of helps soothe me. And it's people that I've have company, so to speak, while I'm working, but right. it's not distracting. So example, right. I love Lucy, uh, the Andy Griffith show, you know, oh. and, and the, to say this, and this might, maybe you want to research this deeper. Like I love the Andy Griffith show and I love Lucy and I can look at those. I know the episodes backwards and forwards. And then people will say, somebody else black will say, well, there was not even black people on those shows. And I'm like, I know that. I know that. <laughs> but it still helps that. me and I still feel grounded by just kind of seeing it, which I think yeah. is the power of nostalgia. It really kind of grounds you in a kind of beautiful way, but at the same time, it can also kind of change your decision making because if you make future decisions based on your maybe flawed perception of the past, that may not always lead to kind of great outcomes. But to your yeah. point, it can be very beautiful and it can be very comforting as well. So I think yeah. nostalgia is just really fascinating in that way. Yeah. And I'd love to explore it further. Yes, I think that is a great idea. Let me know when that comes out. <laughs> okay. <laughs> And I said, I think a lot of people will be able to, you know, if they see that they have any personal challenges or in a spiral, as you say, please check out this book and read some of the techniques um, that you have in that book that have been incredibly researched uh, and see how you may be able to work your way through to the other side. And we all need that. So, you know, at some time or another, we will be affected by a mental health condition because like I was saying, even grief can bring about mental health stresses and illnesses. Uh, you've got to work your way through those seven stages, I believe it is, of grief. So yeah, so that, that certainly is something that can affect us all. And basically what your book goes back to saying, all that you've done in technique is that to your own self be true, to thine own self be true. You've got to be true for your, through, uh, of yourself, you as you and your career, 
you, as you said, with your you and your girlfriend possibly making a decision not to have children, even though it goes against your heavy cultural influence of having children. You got to be true to yourself. That's the right. first thing that keeps you on a path of clarity before you spiral into then to some kind of depression. Because when you try to please others and you have not pleased yourself, you're going down. You're totally. going down by just pleasing others all the time. So yeah, you got to learn how to say no you know, and uh, and all of these kind of things and to stick to your guns, if nothing else. So, but yes, definitely we will have all of your media, social media handles down below and in the show notes of the podcast. And we'll have a link so that everyone can buy your book. So we're just so grateful that you did write this, Rohit, and was truthful to yourself. Thank you so much for having me, Deirdre. It was a wonderful conversation and really appreciate you taking the time and excited to kind of share more on this journey. Yes, sounds great, Rohit. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for joining the Bookaholic Podcast. We appreciate your support. Remember to subscribe to the podcast. Follow us on Instagram at True Bookaholic. You can also email us at readingjunkie at book-a-holic.com. Don't forget to support your local library and independent bookstores.